I'll give you three reasons why you need to learn Java. Besides being one of the top three most popular programming languages worldwide, Java is an extremely flexible language. It's used extensively by business enterprises, Android apps, games, and if you learn Java, you could land a job as a Java developer. According to Glassdoor, entry-level Java developers have an average starting salary of $70,000. That's nothing to sneeze at. So, why not learn Java? Are you still here? Okay, cool. Let's begin with the basics. Computer languages are on a spectrum between being high-level and low-level. Computers only understand binary. It's referred to as machine code. It's a low-level format that a machine can understand. However, humans have difficulty reading binary since it's all ones and zeros. To create machine code, we write in a format called source code, which is understandable by humans, and compile to machine code. When we create Java source code, the file ends with a .java file extension. Think of compiling code as transforming source code to machine code. We do this because machines can't read source code and vice versa. Humans have trouble reading machine code, unless you're a robot or an android or something. However, when we compile our source code to machine code, it's machine specific. If we write source code and compile on a Mac, we can only run that code on a Mac and the same concept applies for PCs. Although, the Java language has a solution for this problem. With Java, we have an intermediary step where we can compile our source code to a format called bytecode. Bytecode is cross-platform and ends with a .class file extension. Here's an example of Java source code, and here's an example of that same source code after we compile it to bytecode. It's kind of funky, right? Since bytecode is cross-platform, you could write your code on a Mac and then send your bytecode file to your friend who can then run it on their PC using a JVM to translate the bytecode to machine code. But we are going to need the help of a JVM to translate bytecode to machine code. But where can we get a JVM? Well, it's included with a JDK. And what is a JDK? Well, JDK is an acronym for Java Development Kit. It contains developers' tools to help us code, as well as a JRE, a Java Runtime Environment, which contains a library, toolkits, and our JVM, which is another acronym for Java Virtual Machine, which translates bytecode for us to machine code. So all you need to worry about is downloading a JDK and everything else will be included. And now that we know what a JDK is, it's time to download one. So open up the internet and go to any search engine and look this up. Java JDK download, go to the first link, Java SE downloads, SE stands for standard edition. Go to JDK download, scroll down and find the appropriate file for your operating system. Since I'm running Windows, I'm going to download this EXE version agree to whatever, and download. And when this finishes downloading, I'm going to open this. Open when done. On my computer, I currently have a JDK already installed, but I'm going to go ahead and reinstall it for the sake of this video. Click next, next, then wait a little bit, and close. I would also recommend an IDE, that's another acronym, and it stands for Integrated Development Environment. Think of it as software that helps us write other software. You could write code with a text editor such as Notepad and then compile the text file, but doing so is not really beginner friendly. So an IDE provides an interface for us to write code, check for errors, compile, and run code. There's two IDEs that I would recommend. They are both Eclipse or IntelliJ IDEA. It doesn't matter which one you download because the code that we write is still the same. So let's download an IDE. Now it's time to install the IDE. I would recommend either the Eclipse IDE or IntelliJ IDEA. I'm more comfortable with Eclipse, so I'm going to stick with Eclipse. So go back to the interwebs and look up either Eclipse IDE or IntelliJ IDEA IDE. So I'm going to look up Eclipse, click the first link, Click this orange download button, go to download packages, and select Eclipse IDE for Java developers, and select the correct download for your machine. I'm going to select the download for Windows, and click download. And then just wait a little bit again, like usual. For me, this is currently a zip file, so I need to select this file and extract all. 
with the newly extracted folder, navigate to this Eclipse application. So you can select this to launch Eclipse. For convenience, I'm going to create a desktop shortcut. So for me, I'm going to go to, where is it? Send to, create desktop shortcut, and then click to launch. You can select a workspace. I'm going to use the default and click launch. We are now within Eclipse and we can begin a new project. We are now ready to rock and roll. So let's begin by creating our first Java program. But in order to do so, we need to create a Java project. If you're brought to this welcome screen, you can close out of this because it's annoying. And in order to create a Java project, navigate to your package explorer and select create a Java project. If you're missing the package explorer, you can go to file, new, Java project, and that will take you to the same place. We need a unique name for this Java project. I will call this my first program. And I will want to configure the JRE, the Java runtime environment. And we downloaded that with the JDK because the JRE is a component of the JDK. So I'm currently using 13. I'm going to change this to 15. That was the one that I more recently downloaded just now. So go to configure JREs, and I'm going to click add. Select standard VM. VM is virtual machine. Click next. Go to JRE home. Go to directory. And I'm going to make sure that I'm selecting the most recent JDK. For me, that is 15. Select folder. Finish. Apply. Apply and close. Then finish. If this window pops up, you can select don't create. That's to create a module. If you look to the left hand side within the projects folder, we now have a Java project called my first program, but we will need to add what is called a class to this project. A class is a collection of related code. So in order to add a class to this project, I'm going to select this project folder, then go to file, new, class, and we need a unique name for this class. I usually call this main, but you can name it whatever you want. And then we are going to check this public static void main checkbox and then click finish. With that out of the way, take a look back within your project folder and you should now have a Java file that shares the same name as your class name. My class name is named main, therefore my Java file is also called main. So this has the .java file extension, and with what we discussed before, this is source code. It's in a format that humans can easily read and understand. And when we compile this source code to bytecode, we're going to create a new file that has the .class file extension. And with that bytecode file, we can run that and translate it using a JVM, a Java virtual machine. Here's our Java file and we have our class and mine is called main. So all the class is, is that it's a collection of related code. We won't be exploring in depth on the topic of classes until we reach the subject of object oriented programming, which is about 20 videos into this playlist. So you have some time. So this is our class. Mine is called main. Anything within the outer set of curly braces belongs to the class and is contained within. And within our class, we have what is called a main method. Our program won't run without this method because when we run our code, we begin by calling the main method. So if we were to compile and run this code, you can do so by clicking the screenplay button. All output is displayed to the console window and nothing appears to happen because we haven't written anything yet. So if we were to remove this main method and try to do this again, we would encounter an error because our main method was not found in the class main. It's asking us to please define the main method. Now looking back, when we created our class, we went to file, new, class, and in order to generate the main method, we checked this checkbox here that states public static void main. So the main method generated for us when we created this class, but if we're missing it, we can easily just type it in a textbook that I read in college said to think of the main method as a magical spell or incantation that we have to say in order to get this program to run. So we are currently missing a main method, but we can easily just type it in. So repeat after me, public static void main, 
then we need some parentheses, string, straight braces, args, and then a set of curly braces. And that is it. We now have a main method. And our program runs and compiles just fine. So any code within the main method will execute starting at the top and then work its way down. So with the main method, any code you place at the top will be executed first. So let's print something to the console window. In order to display some text, all you have to do is type this system with a capital S dot out dot print. Then you need a set of parentheses and then a semicolon at the end. So within the parentheses of this print method, we can type some text to display to the console window, but we need to make sure that our text is within a set of double quotes and we can display some text. Let's say, I don't know, what's a food you like? I love pizza. So if I were to run and compile this, it's now going to print I love pizza to the console window. Let's say that we would like to display another line of text directly underneath the first. We can accomplish that by using another print statement. So for convenience, I'm going to copy this first line, paste it directly underneath, and display some other text, such as, it's really good. So when I compile and run this, pay attention, the output is one long line of text. The reason that this is all displaying as one long line of text is because after printing the first statement, our cursor does not move down to the next line. In order to do so, we could use a print ln statement, short for print line. It's as if we're hitting enter when we finish outputting our text. So let's try this again using a print ln statement. And now each line of text is on its own individual line. So that's what distinguishes a print and print line statement. A print line will add a new line character as if you're hitting enter when you finish outputting your text, whereas a print statement does not. So that's the difference between the two. An alternative to using a print line statement is that we could stick with the standard print statement and at the end of our text, add what is referred to as an escape sequence for a new character. Now, an escape sequence is a character preceded with a backslash and one of a few characters that follows directly afterwards. This is an escape sequence for a new line character. When we add this escape sequence for a new line, it's as if we're hitting enter wherever we place this escape sequence. So within our string of text for our first line, at the end, we're going to add backslash n, and this will have the same effect as a print line statement. It's going to display our text and then move the cursor down to the next line. As you can see, there is no additional change to the output within the console window. Now, what if we reverted our print statements back to print line statements and kept the additional escape sequence in for a new line character? Well, we're going to have an extra empty line of text because we're displaying our line of output plus an additional character for a new line, and then we're hitting enter at the end via the print line statement. So we're going to have an additional empty line between these two lines of text if we were to do that. So a few other escape sequences that you might be interested in include the following. A backslash T will add a tab. So let's precede our text with an escape sequence for a tab, which is backslash T. So this is if we're hitting tab before displaying our text. And we now have some empty space preceding our line of output. If you need to put something within quotes, let's try to do so normally. So our compiler is actually going to be confused because we cannot normally add a set of quotes because our text already needs to be surrounded with quotes. So if we need to literally display some quotes, some double quotes, we need to precede our double quotes with an escape sequence. So backslash, then quotes. So this will allow us to literally print some double quotes. So we're going to surround our first line of text with some double quotes now. And if you need to display a backslash, then you need to use double backslashes. Because if you use just one, your compiler thinks you're trying to use an escape sequence. And that's how to display a backslash. In summary, anything preceding with a backslash is the beginning of an escape sequence, and there's one of a multitude of characters that could follow afterwards. And depending on the character, this has special meaning for your compiler to do something specific. Now, anything that is following two forward slashes is the beginning of a single line comment. I could write, this is a comment, and this line of text 
is going to be ignored by the compiler. So there's going to be no change to this program with the additional comment. Anything that is a comment is ignored by the compiler. So it's useful if you need to leave yourself a note or for somebody else that's looking over your code. If you need a multi-line comment, that is a forward slash followed by an asterisk. And anything up to an asterisk and another forward slash will be the bounds of this comment. So I could write on a new line for each word, this is a comment. And all of this will also be ignored by the compiler. So that's how to write a multi-line comment, a forward slash and an asterisk, and anything up to another asterisk and forward slash. So those are comments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for this section on tips and tricks. And for my first trick, I'm going to change the color scheme of my IDE. We're currently using the light theme, but I much prefer the dark theme. I'm going to be joining the dark side. So in order to change the color scheme of your IDE, go to, if you're using Eclipse, Window, Preferences, under the General tab, go to Appearance, Theme, and you can change the theme here. I will click Dark. I'm going to select Apply. OK, and then Apply and Close. So the dark theme is great if you want to feel like a pretend elite hacker. For my next trick, I'm going to change the font color as well as the background color of my console window. In order to do so, head back to Window, Preferences, under Run Debug, go to Console, and you can change the color schemes here. I'm going to change the text color to a bright green, click OK, as well as the background color to a slightly lighter shade of black. That should be good. When you're finished, click Apply, and then Apply and Close. And you may need to run this again to see the changes. So that's how to change the font color as well as the background color of your console window. So it's somewhat tedious to have to write a print line statement, correct? System.out.println. Normally that's a lot to type. So a shortcut would be to type sysout, then hold control space. And your IDE will auto-generate the rest of this print line statement for you. Let's move on to trick number four. Let's say that we have hundreds of different print line statements and we need to change the text to print because we made a mistake. So there's a feature where we can replace some text in your program with another. So let's pretend we would like to replace print line with print. So go to edit, find replace, and we can replace some text with something else. Let's find each instance of print line and replace this with print. Then click replace all. So that will take care of all that for you. Let's move on to some final tips. So with spaces, spaces don't make much of a difference within your code. For example, after this dot and my print portion of this print statement, I could add a bunch of spaces for no reason. And this would run and compile just fine. I'm not sure why you would do that, but that's just to reinforce the point that spaces don't make much of a difference. Unless you're using a space to split up some keywords, then you might run into an issue, or if you're adding space to a string, well then that's going to have a noticeable effect. So spaces, for the most part, don't really matter too much, depending on where they are. Here's a trick on zooming in or out. Hold Control minus to zoom out, or Control plus to zoom in. Or you could go to Window, Editor, then Zoom in or Zoom out within this menu. Here's my last tip for you. Let's say you accidentally close out of your Package Explorer or your Console window. You can easily bring those back by going to Window, Show View, and then they are all listed here. So I would like to bring back my Package Explorer as well as my console window. I hope you find out this video useful. If you like it, then press the like button. Share this with your friends or anyone who wants to make his career in Java. Do you have any suggestions regarding the content? Comment section is all yours. This is the first part of the series. If you want in other parts, then do subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.